Hello all, Rick here with another series of patrol side quests from Star Trek Online as we move away from the Azure Nebula region and fresh off the Jurat system. Our course takes us towards the former Romulan neutral zone. Currently this area is in the hands of the Romulan Republic, which itself was formed from the settled worlds in the wake of the Romulan supernova 23 years ago, so these are technically both former Federation and Romulan worlds. Admiral Picard tore down the neutral zone during his evacuation efforts, but belligerent Star Empire remnants still demand continual watch from a series of star bases along the new border. The first stop on our patrol is the Sitor system, which we previously visited with Agent Daniels to locate Sela, and also discovered the eventual fate of Tasha Yar. Nothing else to see here at the moment, however, and so we move on to the Ido system, and Ido 4 catches our attention. It's the largest Class K planet in the Beta Quadrant, at 17,047 kilometres, and the UFP wished to dispatch science teams here to investigate, but it lies in Romulan space, so discussions are tabled for a later date. As we enter the system, the Starfleet officer assigned to monitor it contacts us, Commander Argus Genstra. He lets us know that the Herogen, arriving here from the fringes of the Beta Delta border over the last few decades, have been attacking transports from this system, and we are to drive out the Herogen ships. He suspects they've been congregating near the asteroids around the planet's ring system, so we move to engage. It's a standard sweep and clear operation. The Herogen themselves were invited here by Empress Sela when she was consolidating her power but it was only a matter of time before the nomadic species eventually found their way out here anyway, as expansive as their pursuit of new quarry is. Sure enough, they don't take kindly to our arrival in the system that they have claimed, and a battle is swift. Their smaller escorts might be more than a match for a lone cargo or transport ship, but not the armager. With the job done, Genstra prepares a report for Admiral Tanay, the Admiralty's overseer for the Romulan Federation operations. Moving on, we set a course for Unroth next. The Unroth used to house a Romulan colony that came under attack by the Breen and Dominion during the Dominion War. It was liberated by the Tau Shiar shortly after, but remained in their hands. We have received no indicators of trouble, however, and it would be unwise to simply provoke the Tau Shiar by entering their space. We pass Brea 3, which we have not visited for well over a year now. It's a tropical world with a Romulan resort that was converted into a base of operations for Hakiv of the Tal Shi'ar back when he was still alive. We were part of the Battle of Brea 3, and since then, well, its ownership is sort of up in the air. The next stop is the Kellyan system, which is flooded with Thoron radiation. This blocks subspace comms through the area, so a series of transceivers carry communications back to Starbase 39 like old-fashioned telephone wires. Despite this, Gellian Prime is habitable, and is earmarked for future viability tests. Appropriately tuning our metaphasic shielding, we enter the system. At first, we spy at a Deridex Warbird, appearing to sabotage some of these receivers, but on closer inspection, it is one listed as stolen, and in fact is in the hands of Riemann extremists. Not all the Riemanns have allied with the Romulan Republic, some are still under the thumb of the Star Empire, and more remain disillusioned with any Romulan or Federation presence, and act to harass any form of security or alliance established. We drive off the saboteurs and repair the arrays, confirming with Starbase 39 that all is complete before moving on. The next system of interest is Musou Prime. There's an unaffiliated colony here with a focus on trade. The Musou outpost is one of loose commerce and rife with swindlers, so while you can find all sorts of commodities here, you best keep your wits about you lest you pay more than it's worth. As we enter, we're approached by a Ferengi Marauder class, it's the Shadows Fallen. Its listed captain is a Daemon Brox who has a notation assigned that Starfleet is chasing him down to continue negotiations for some Zenite ore he possesses. We need the ore for a colony on Merak II, in aid of curtailing a botanical plague, and apparently Starfleet has already paid him for the shipments, yet he has failed to deliver. Well, knock knock, Brox. We hail him, but Commander Tarsi tells us he is ignoring us. However, there is a single Ferengi life sign on Muso Prime below, so we order the Armager to keep Shadow's Folly from leaving, while we beam down to chase this lead. 
Arriving on the planet's complex, we're greeted by industrial browns and a spacious trade hall. Not quite the bustling trade markets of Metallus or the Kronos Trade Center, but wouldn't you know it, Brox is here. His opening line to us is, go away, claiming he does not deal with the Federation, but we might be able to come to an agreement. You know what, I'll humour him. I don't want to do the paperwork of seizing him just yet. He says Riv Ender is a hollow novel merchant and has a copy of something Brox needs. However, Riv Ender will not sell to Brox, claiming that the Ferengi does not understand his friends. Strange, let's look into this out of curiosity, and if all else fails, we can just switch tactic and play rough. For now, we make our way across the hall to speak with this hollow merchant. Riv appears to be of Vulcan Bajoran heritage, and he mistakes us for associates of someone called Zeno before cutting himself off. He tells us that he's not organic, that he too is a hologram, which might explain his selectiveness in passing on holo novels to clients. He says he is the creation of Felix, a renowned novelist who specialises in creating programmes that are, at the very least, appearing to be self-aware, like Vic Fontaine. However, Riv appears to be genuinely sentient, employing similar coding that led to the EMH Doctor developing true self-determination. This is why he only passes out his novels to people who will appreciate them, even if the hollow characters in these tales are merely programs. He suggests we talk to the protagonist of this novel, a Vulcan called Varna, and then he'll decide if he wants to trade us a copy. We load up the program's characters on the nearby display and see... Uh, oh, is that a metal bikini? Uh, unexpected. Is this an 80s swords and sorcery kind of thing? Or whatever. Uh, hello, Varna. She opens with, I am yours, before looking around and noting this is not the Ponfar pit. I don't think they have those. Is that a thing? Tell me, Varna, what do you do? Oh, she does whatever we tell her to do. Right, I think I know what kind of program this is. Tell me about yourself then, Varna. She says she is a slave and that she tries to suppress her emotions, but it's difficult because we arouse such passion. Oh no. Um, <laughs> this has severe problems if she is as sentient as Riv is over there. However, when we inquire as to if she knows that she's a hologram or not, she defaults to a more official sounding, that is beyond the scope of my programming, please make another inquiry. Okay, I'm relieved, I think, because this could have gone very dark. We tell her of the scope of the Merak 2 dilemma and the ore needed, but again she fails to compute the inquiry. If we try to present her with anything beyond the scope of the novel in which she is a character, she does not understand. So it seems that she's entirely operating on computer coding, limited capacity characters reading from a script, not sentient or free thinking at all, which raises a question as to why Riv wanted us to talk to Varna in the first place. We travel back to him to ask, and he seems prepared for our return. Riv notes that the novel is over 50 years old already, and presents his unique perspective on the matter. He says that, while on the holodeck, she acts, feels, and thinks within the context of the program, and that if she is unable to fulfil her role, then she finds it unhappy. All he asks is that we think about that the next time we start a hollow program of any variety whether women warriors at the River of Blood, or the Battle of the Mutara Nebula. He agrees to give us the program and pass it on to Brox. Well, mission done, but it invites reflection. Certainly, if this hollow program was sentient and saw itself as a person, then the role she was forced into would be unethical in the extreme. But this is a hollow novel, and it's too basic to allow for emergent thought and is complete fiction. While the premise of the novel might be suspect, it's an interesting point posed to us from Riv that when you press play on a piece of media, you best honour it by engaging it as it expects you to, even if apparently that is a copy of Vulcan Love Slave. We approach Brox and hand over his copy of the apparently uncut edition. He says his collection is complete, and that at last he owns a lot of novels that I really do not want to picture. 
He suggests a new rule of acquisition, that women and finances don't mix, but holodecks are always happy, and I want to be away from this man as soon as possible. Well, that was an experience. I'm not entirely certain of the point Riv was making, except that if I boot up a holo program of any kind, I engage with it properly? Within the Federation, the case regarding sentient holo programs has been pioneered by the Doctor's legal battles, but now most publishers have rules in place to prevent programs becoming too developed, because if they cross the line into awareness then all sorts of moral dilemmas arise. I was not expecting this trail of thought today. Next up, Sereni Prime passes by, a location of an independent Romulan colony that we visited a while ago. No issues here, so we move on to the Hakona system. This houses the Vault, a location which saw the Narada refit by the Tal Shiar with extensive Borg technology from a harvested Borg sphere inside, and seen in episode 18 of this story series. All is quiet here, so we leave the Urnoth sector and enter Aragama with our first stop being the Tur system. Tur 2 is a Class P world covered in ice with a temperature of minus 70 Celsius. However, materium deposits are present, leading to hard mining colonies to retrieve the ore used in ship construction. Entering the system, we learn that Riemann aggressors have also been targeting the mining efforts in this system too, so we continue our operations to fend them off. We have to destroy five ships before the Riemanns get the message and retreat. It's insane the number of older Romulan vessels that the Riemann rebellions managed to seize, thanks to the aftermath of the supernova. Leaving the system, we make for Agrama 2. Now, Grama makes the first planet that is still Star Empire territory, seized from the Orion Syndicate years ago, and it remains an Imperial colony. We best steer clear. Pilatus Prime suffers from extreme tectonic activity, and all efforts to settle it have resulted in emergency evacuations. The Federation offered the Star Empire seismic stabilizers and to help found a colony as an olive branch, but was refuted. So next up is the Siena system. Now Siena 1 is a ringed class G planet of argon and hydrogen. We have intel here from Starfleet intelligence that a Romulan Empire and Herogen meeting is going to be taking place, so we investigate. We can see that there are indeed bases placed upon the larger asteroids in the rings of Siena. However, despite the rings, this cannot be Siena 1 as it is clearly not a gas giant, but a terrestrial world. Nevertheless, we eliminate the Herogen ships that move to attack us, curtailing any meetings that might occur today. That concludes the patrol of the Argama system, and next up is the Lyris sector, and its first system of interest, the Villa 2. There are only two planets here. One is a gas supergiant, while two is a small Class C planetoid now coated in volcanic ash. 100,000 years ago, it had been even more volcanic in the past, but it's now cooled. Entering the system over for Villa 2, we can spy from orbit the sulfurous yellows and mineral deposits shrouded in ashy clouds. It's orbited by a single moon, and we can detect a wreckage ahead, possibly Starfleet. It looks old, possibly a defiant ship or the saucer of some other craft, but it matches with the remains of a missing cargo fleet, but it's only one craft from a convoy that vanished a little time ago. We moved in to continue our search and find a dismembered nacelle. The next part proves difficult to locate and after some searching, we find two more wrecks. Tarsi completes her analysis and reveals Herogen weapon signatures. This must have been the remains of one of those cargo runs that they had been attacking. We pick up an old warp trail that might lead to Herogen base, however, we're not following this path today. Instead, we compile the missing ship report and request a salvage team, and suggest a covert recon team to trace the Herogen. Meanwhile, we set a course for the Kashan system, which features an M-class world under Star Empire control. Its ring system are known as the Shards, and apparently provided shelter from an ion storm during the Romulan Exodus thousands of years ago. We enter the system in response to a distress call from an orbital facility around a separate planet here. Temet tells us it's a Herogen holographic hunting ground, 
and the technology had been provided to the Herogen by the USS Voyager as a way to keep the Herogen together instead of spreading apart in pursuit of prey. However, the Herogen have a habit of not abiding to those same restrictions I was mentioning earlier about limiting the programs. They prefer their prey to think, feel, and be truly sentient, which brings us to today. The distress call comes from the holograms within the training ground. Smet comes up with a plan of rescue. We can tether the Armage's holodeck memory to the Herogen base and establish a download link. From there, any holoprograms that wish can transfer themselves through the ether to our computers, but it will require a 60 second period to complete. We also need to remain in range of the outpost, which is covered by a battleship or two. Great. Well, we can start by engaging the Herogen vessels, defeating them so that we'll have an easier time in rescuing these holograms. Then we close in on the base to establish the link. After a minute, we have received numerous hollow programs, and an Apex battleship arrives to attack, and we have to engage this too before we can leave safely. For now, these programs can accompany us on our patrols, but we must return them to the Soong Foundation, where they can petition for Federation recognition under its synthetic life laws. We depart quickly for the Laris system. Now, Laris Prime is another ringed world that supported life three million years ago, but it's long since barren. There's a patrol mission here, but we've already completed it, so we move on to the last stop, the Delta Corvi system. Delta Corvi was the site of a 2409 Elachi invasion, and since then the planet has been rendered uninhabitable from Tholeron from Thaleron radiation to spite Tau Shi'ar occupation. There's nothing left here to investigate. The system in real life is also known as Elograb and part of the Corvus constellation. The star is 2.7 times the mass of our Sol and 69 times brighter. Nice. Unfortunately, it does not appear to have a planetary system around it from what we can see. So, that concludes this arm of our patrol journey. Dealing with and driving out Riemann aggressors and Herogen attacks was the bulk of what we did here. However, there was the unexpected occurrence of holographic rights and what constitutes going too far with programs. It seems there is a definite line between sentient holoprograms like the Doctor or Riv Ender, aware ones like Vic Fontaine, and truly on the rails ones like Varna. Discerning that line is an ongoing process, but one the Federation is increasingly becoming aware of. But I think it just begins with recognising a plea for help. Thanks for watching these patrols in the ongoing story series of Star Trek Online's side quests. I've been Rick, and until the next batch of missions, thanks again, and goodbye.